Oh, there they are. Good. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, uh, yeah, great. Matt, you're there. Ellen, you're here. Brigitte, you're there. In the middle. Again, in your, in your uh, program are a little more extended bi bios of our great speaker. I'm sorry? <laughs> That's so cool. Plan this. I know, that was not planned. That's good. There should be a few little spontaneity here. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> uh, this is great. So let me just, uh, let me just start off with, uh, with just introducing that they're going to speak in different order here. Um, but Ellen Brown is the uh, founder and the uh, president of the Public Banking Institute. And uh, much of what we're about has come out of her research and the book that she wrote, Web of Debt. And now she has a new book out, which is not quite ready yet, but sh shortly, right? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Um, a, a new, her new book, The Public Banking Solution. So if you miss anything, you can read the book and it'll be, it'll be in there. Um, so that's Ellen. Uh, next to her is Brigida Yon's daughter. Uh, they can tell who's who in New Zealand they have. I mean, in uh, Iceland. <laughs> Brigida claims mostly to be an author and a poet, and, and a mother, of course, etc. cetera. But um, somehow or other, and I, I think that's part of her, what she'll tell you is how she got involved in changing the whole banking and political framework of Iceland. She's a member of parliament there. For many of you, Gar Aperowitz doesn't need an introduction. He's, uh, uh, he's actually older than I am, and so you know, <laughs> I have to defer to him. Um, <laughs> His, he's a professor of political economy at the University of Maryland and the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. Um, his resume reads a little bit like the schools you should go to, like King's College and Cambridge and Harvard. Um, and he has a new book, uh, What Then Must We Do? Straight Talk About the Next American Revolution. And and both his book and, and Ellen's book will be available at the back uh, after the uh, event. And uh, the two of them will be up here to, to sign books at the end. Now, let me introduce our first speaker, Matt Taibbi. Woo! Yay! <laughs> the, uh, he's a, a, a major contributor to the Rolling Stone magazine. His article today skewered the SEC, if you did, didn't read it. And uh, he's the author of uh, Griftopia, which is, which is also available in the back. And um, I'll kind of let him do his own uh, content in that. But we're welcome. We're really pleased to have you here, Matt. And it's your stage.
thank you. That, that squid thing was hilarious. <laughs> that's like the funniest thing that's ever happened to me at a speech. And, um, well, first of all, I want to thank the uh, Public Banking Institute for, for bringing me out here. Um, I want to thank Shelley and Mark and Susan and all the people who uh, made this happen. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. It's already been uh, a tremendous education. Um, just talking to people in the reception uh, beforehand, I was actually kind of overwhelmed by all the ideas that everybody seemed to have and the, the earnestness and the, the vibe. It's just it's very different than New York. Um, <laughs> It's actually, it kind of reminded me of this one time, a long, long time ago, I wrote a story about um, Bernie Sanders, the, uh, the senator from, uh, this is back when Bern Bernie was in the house and he sort of graciously invited me to spend a month hanging around with him, like for the entire time that he was doing his job and his whole purpose was to sort of show me how the house worked and he wanted to be transparent about it and I, I thought that was a cool idea and I went to my editor to, to sort of pitch this story and he goes, oh, Bernie Sanders, uh, that's the guy who cares, right? And uh, so I said, yeah, that's, that's him. But um, I, think, uh, I think all you people here are the people who care. That's, that's, that's pretty clear, and that's, that's very cool. So it's very cool for me to be here, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, So I think one of the things we all have in common, or many of us have in common, is that uh, a lot of us didn't know a whole lot about banking uh, and about the modern financial services sector uh, until relatively recently. Uh, that's part of what this is all about, is that we're all not only sort of educating the world about how it works, but also ourselves. Uh, and so to that end, I sort of wanted to talk about how I, how I came to cover this subject, because um, if you had told me 20 years ago that I would be covering the Wall Street and the financial services sector, I would have thought I was having an acid flashback. Uh, I, up until five or six years ago, I couldn't even balance my checkbook. And, um, and then in, uh, one day in, uh, in the summer of 2008, um, I was just sort of a regular political reporter uh, up until that time. I, covered campaigns and the campaign trail and tried to make something out of that incredibly stupid story. And uh, one day, does everybody here remember Drill Baby Drill? Yeah, great idea, right? Um, so I was in uh, Kenner, Louisiana uh, with the uh, traveling press corps following John McCain and uh, you're laughing. Yeah, it was horrible. And um, <laughs> you know, we'd all we'd all been following. You know, it's sort of like prison, the traveling press. You never get to leave the plane. You're with the same people all the time, and and every little thing becomes magnified in importance and interesting. And and McCain unveiled this drill baby drill speech, uh, or at least a new version of it, uh, in this little town outside New Orleans one night. Uh, in the summer of 2008, and um, was, of course there was raucous applause, it was a Republican crowd, it seemed to be a big hit on television afterwards, um, and then on the way back into the plane, uh, of course Drill Baby Drill was McCain's solution for this problem that we were having in the summer of 2008, which was that oil prices were skyrocketing and we were suddenly paying an, an awful lot for, for gasoline. Um, and on the way back to the plane, all the reporters were sort of the national sport of reporters is to laugh at candidates behind their back. Um, of course, most they all grovel to the candidates to their faces, but behind their backs, uh, they're always busting on them, making fun of them. And um, on the way back to the plane that night, uh, this one television reporter was, was ripping McCain and saying, you know, God, what an idiot, as though, as though drilling in the Gulf of Mexico had anything to do with why gas prices are skyrocketing right now. And I kind of raised my hand and I said, uh, do we actually know why gas prices are skyrocketing right now? And it was like a cartoon, you know, with the crickets. Uh, <laughs> literally, literally nobody knew. And this is the cream of the national press corps, right? The 
world's top political reporters, and we, we're sitting there in complete, total ignorance. And, um, and so I sat down in the plane, and I, and I turned to this other TV guy who I knew very well, funny guy, and I, I looked at him and I said, you know, doesn't that make us all frauds? And he goes, you're just figuring that out now? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously it's the job of all reporters to pretend to be experts on things that we know absolutely nothing about um, but I was genuinely rattled by, by that moment in my career it, it occurred to me that, that we were covering the economy we were covering all kinds of things without having any even the faintest idea of, of how they worked and so I sort of on my own that summer uh, you know, in between covering campaign stories, started to make some phone calls. You know, how does the commodities market work? Why is gas, why are gas prices high? What's going on? And I finally found a couple of commodities analysts who were able to speak in a language that, that I could understand. Uh, there was a, uh, a Saudi gentleman who I talked to uh, a lot that summer, and he, he sort of walked me through a lot of things. Uh, and he, he led me through this just sort of elaborate history of, of commodities. Uh, and prices, uh, and it was this whole world that I'd never been introduced to. Um, and he told me about the Commodities Exchange Act of 1936, uh, and he told me that theoretically, uh, the amount of speculative activity on the commodities markets uh, was supposed to be fairly tightly regulated, that they divided the participants up in these markets into different categories. Um, there were speculators on the one hand, and then there were these other participants called what they what they call physical hedgers and those were real either consumers or producers of commodities and the idea of uh, of these regulations was to make sure that um, that most of the activity on the commodities markets was being uh, was being done by p actual real consumers or producers of uh, of these commodities like corn and oil and soybeans and wheat and whatever. The idea being that they didn't want speculators to overwhelm uh, pricing activity. And so they, they had sort of rigidly defined standards for how, for who was a phys physical hedger and who was a speculator. And for six, seven decades uh, a after they established this law, the system worked fairly well. Uh, and there was never a situation where speculators were creating bubbles instantly or driving prices up, uh, you know, two and three hundred percent in a couple of months. Um, that just didn't happen with regularity until recently. And I asked why that was, and he said, well, beginning in the early 1990s, um, a lot of these companies that were these big financial companies uh, started quietly applying to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, which regulates commodities, and they started asking for exemptions. There were speculators that wanted to be treated as physical hedgers so that they could participate more in these markets. And so what they did is they, they sent letters to the CFTC and they gave reasons why they should be treated as, as real consumers even though they weren't. Um, and beginning in 1991, the CFTC quietly began writing these exemption letters. Uh, the first one that they, that they wrote uh, was in 1991. It was to a company called J. Aaron, which turned out to be a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. And uh, after 1991, over the course of the next uh, nine or ten years or so, they quietly dispensed 17 more of these letters uh, until, before you knew it, basically every major bank and financial company on Wall Street was suddenly acting like a real producer or consumer of jet fuel and corn and wheat and soybeans and all these things that are essential to everyday life. This process was so cloaked in secrecy that even the House Agriculture Committee, which has direct jurisdiction uh, over commodities, um, didn't know about it for the first six or seven years after these letters started being distributed. Uh, it came up randomly in a House hearing in 1997, and I remember I, s I spoke to uh, one of the House aides who was there that day, uh, and he said that his boss was questioning a CFTC official who just sort of inadvertently mentioned that he had been handing out these exemptions to financial companies. Uh, and the congressman is like, well, what exemptions? Can I see one? Um, and the, 
the answer that he gave the CFTC official, uh, it always sticks in my mind. He said, I have to ask Goldman first. Uh, <laughs> so here's, here you have a government regulator that is telling a congressman who has jurisdiction over this you know, market that's critical to all of our lives, that, you know, every a dozen transactions a day, that he can't hand over a copy of one of these exemption letters until he asks a financial company for permission first. Um, so they did eventually get copies of these letters uh, and you know, they were able to show me what they looked like and, I, and it was just this incredible awakening for me that all this was going on. Uh, and this, this was all part of the explanation um, as for why, for instance, in the year 2003, uh, there was only, there was $29 billion of um, speculative activity on the commodities markets uh, in the year 2003. By 2007 and 2008, the year we had that big price hike, uh, the amount of speculative uh, investment uh, in those markets uh, had gone up by a factor of 10. Uh, it was over $300 billion. Uh, and this to me seemed like at least a partial explanation for why price, prices were skyrocketing and, and going through the roof. Uh, one of the features of the commodities markets, unlike the stock market, is that uh, you can't really bet against commodities. Most of the investment in, the, in commodity, uh, m most commodity investing is what they call long investment. Um, they're not shorting the market, they're betting on prices to go up. So if you suddenly have 10 times the amount of investment in oil that you had a couple of years ago and it's all betting on the price to go up, well, that, that's going to have an effect on prices. It's not easy to quantify exactly what effect, but it had some kind of effect. Anyway, all this is sort of background to this realization that just in this one tiny question of exactly how full of shit was John McCain uh, <laughs> when he gave this speech in Louisiana, I had to do six, seven months of research uh, just to figure out even part of the answer to that question, and I still didn't know the answer after all that time. Uh, and this convinced me it was, it was a real awakening for me a, a, as a reporter. It, it made me realize that there was this whole universe of political decisions and, and secrets and, and complicated bureaucracies that the ordinary citizen knew absolutely nothing about and the press corps also knew nothing about. Um, and I realized nobody was writing about this, nobody was, nobody was covering it. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because it, 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 when I was covering the campaign trail in, in 2004 and 2008 and you listen to the same speeches over and over again and, and you've all listened to these speeches, they say nothing in these speeches. Um, they're completely idiotic. They're, it's the same cliches recycled year after year and you know, what each candidate loves America more than the next and he's draping himself in the flag more than the next one. And it always seemed to me that, uh, and I, uh, that it, our politics couldn't possibly be this stupid, really. Uh, there had to be some deeper reality uh, beneath it all um, that was complicated. Obviously, we're the biggest uh, military and financial empire in the history of the world, in the history of humanity. Uh, it can't all come down to uh, a couple of indistinguishable speeches by, by two different, you know, basically the same party candidates. Um, and it occurred to me... <laughs> and so this is it. This, this is that other more complicated reality that we have not been told about, uh, that the public has not been told about, that the press has not been told about, and each corner of the financial universe is densely complicated and full of uh, labyrinthine bureaucratic rules uh, over which powerful financial interests and lobbyists uh, exert tremendous control and have been for decades and decades and decades and this is this sort of great unreported story of our time and, and that is what the Public Banking Institute now I think really exists for. It's 
the beginning of this process where we're all beginning to realize um, that we abdicated our responsibility to know how our world was being run uh, all these years. I mean, one of the things that, that I found out um, It's funny, you know, when I, when I started to learn more about this, uh, one of the things you realize in, in, almost immediately is that this subject is intense, can, it can be intensely boring. Um, it's cloaked in almost impossibly uh, difficult camouflaging verbiage. Um, it's, it's a language all to itself that's even more uh, inane and difficult to fight through than even the law. Uh, or any other, you know, professional jargon. And I think they intentionally make it that way um, so that the rest of us will not understand it. Um, and because of this, this boringness, this sort of camouflaging uh, impact uh, that all this jargon and, um, and all, these, all this terminology that nobody wants to fight through, um, it has a, has a couple of impacts. Uh, one is that the press can't cover it because uh, you can't do credit default swaps or collateralized debt obligations in 30 seconds on television. It's just impossible to do. Uh, also, it's not something that makes advertisers ter terribly excited. You can't sell Tanqueray gin or Buicks or anything to this subject. Um, so magazines don't cover it either. Uh, that's why we get golf on television. That's why we get everything but this subject. Um, and because, because of that, there's just no attention focused on the financial sector. And so what happens when there's no attention focused on this massive bureaucracy, uh, which is basically about making money, uh, they begin to start crossing lines. And when they cross lines and nobody notices, uh, they realize that they can keep crossing lines. And this, I think, is what happened. This is, this is the phenomenon that we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, but it's especially accelerated in the last, last four or five years, is that the financial sector has realized that nobody really understands what's going on, and so they're continually pushing the envelope, and they're, and they're going farther and farther into, into more and more overtly criminal schemes uh, realizing that the public uh, will not catch on. If you, and if you look at just the last year, I think think about the progression of what's happened just in the last. Well, let's start with five years ago, with the, the mortgage bubble, which was a basic, basically a fraud scheme. Uh, you know, the the metaphor I always use is you know it was banks selling oregano as weed. Uh, this, is, this is really what they were doing. It was banks went out and they sort of factory produced these massive amounts of, of risky subprime loans. Um, they waved a bunch of hocus pocus derivative math over them and then they cranked them out on the other end uh, as AAA rated securities. And so this is sort of a, a modern take in the old Rumpelstiltskin story where you put straw in the one end and you get gold out the other, only in this case it was poor people going in one end and AAA rated securities coming out the other. Uh, it was a simple fraud scheme, but it was executed on a massive scale uh, by the entire industry, by the ratings agencies, by banks, uh, by mortgage lenders like Countrywide. They all played a part in it, uh, and it was just a gigantic version of the same street scam you see in New York City where somebody's selling a phony Prada bag or a phony watch, uh, just that these were phony AAA rated uh, securities. Uh, and that was the scam back five years ago. But even in, five, in the five years since then, they've massively advanced uh, in complexity uh, and boldness and arrogance. In just the last year, we've seen unbelievable financial scandals, the, the biggest one, of course, being the, the um, LIBOR uh, scandal. Has everybody heard of that? Yeah. So this is unbelievable. This is, this is the 16 of the world's biggest banks uh, getting up every morning and basically deciding to rig world interest rates, uh, which is, uh, you know, LIBOR affects 
uh, according to some estimates, between 300 and 500 trillion dollars worth of financial products. Um, and they've been monkeying with, these, with this rate for as far back as 1991, according to some sources. That was just one market manipulation story that came out in the last year. We've also found out that they've uh, probably been uh, manipulating the interest rate swap market, that a similar kind of uh, benchmark rate was being manipulated there. JP Morgan Chase and Barclays both just got busted for manipulating energy prices right here in the state of California. Uh, all of the major banks, uh, the, at least the top five in this country, have all been inveigled in a widespread scheme to rig municipal bond auctions, uh, the, the, the service for municipal bonds. Uh, they've all paid uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, um, uh, Goldman Sachs, they've all paid massive settlements, um, GE, uh, uh, upwards of two, one and two hundred million dollars a piece, but nobody's been indicted, nobody's gone to jail. Credit card service, um, that market has also uh, apparently been being manipulated. Uh, these credit card companies are, are getting together and they're, they're manipulating um, the rates for service for, for consumers. Uh, we've also had the, a massive money laundering scandal from HSBC. I'm sure everybody's heard about this one. Uh, this is the world, Europe's largest bank, HSBC, uh, admitted to laundering, among other things, they admitted to laundering $880 million just for two uh, Central and South American drug cartels, including the Sinaloa drug cartel in Mexico, uh, which is suspected in over 20,000 murders in the last 10 years. The uh, laundering was so overt in that case uh, that uh, the Sinaloa cartel actually had specially designed boxes to fit through HSBC's teller windows. Uh, and in that case, uh, again, nobody was criminally indicted um, in HSBC. And this is sort of um, this is sort of the note that I want to leave uh, everybody with today: is that this process sort of, of aggrandizement and, and continually pushing the envelope and this sort of transformation of financial companies into becoming more like organized crime uh, operations, um, it's been mirrored by a continual weakening of the regulatory and enforcement structures uh, here in the United States. Uh, and this all began, um, oddly enough, way back in 1999 when a, um, a young, uh, then, relatively anonymous lawyer in the Bill Clinton's Justice Department named Eric Holder. Um, he wrote, Eric Holder, back in 1999, wrote a memo um, that was about prosecutions of large companies, and it was, um, it was about collateral consequences. And uh, this is what he wrote. He wrote, prosecutors may consider the collateral consequences of a corporate criminal conviction in determining whether to charge the corporation with a criminal offense. And what he meant by that was, when you charge a big company that employs a lot of people and has a lot of retirees and has a big retirement fund, it's okay for prosecutors to consider the damage that that might cause to that company if you criminally indict that company, uh, which sounds completely reasonable. Um, in fact, a few years later, uh, after Holder wrote this memo, there was a famous incident when the Bush Justice Department decided to indict Arthur Anderson criminally uh, for the relatively mild offense of shredding two tons of documents uh, in the Enron case. And um, in that case, the uh, Arthur Anderson lawyers actually wrote, wrote to the Justice Department and they threatened uh, the Justice Department, they essentially used their employees as a human shield. They said, the department proposes an action that could destroy the firm, taking the livelihoods of thousands of innocent Anderson employees and retirees. So they were essentially holding up all of their employees and saying, if you indict us, we're all going to suffer. And the Bush Depar uh, Justice Department didn't, didn't blink. They indicted anyway. They filed a single felony uh, count. Arthur Anderson went under. 28,000 jobs were lost, and we essentially have not had a criminal indictment against a major company since then. Um, 
and this past year, in this past year when all these criminal scandals I was talking about happened, there was a major development in, this, in the evolution of this collateral consequences idea. In the press conferences and in the hearings after the HSBC and UBS uh, settlements, UBS was settled with the Justice Department for the LIBOR scandal, Holder not only said that we can indict companies uh, for committing major crimes because it might affect the national and even the international economy, but he also strongly implied that we can no longer indict individuals at these companies. So the original intent of this law back in 1999 was to save companies and to save jobs, and they've now successfully transformed that entire concept, which incidentally was dreamed up 10 years before te Too Big to Fail even existed. Um, they've transformed that concept into a kind of permanent um, shield for the employees and executives at these large financial institutions. Uh, so now we not only can indict HSBC, a company which is admitted to laundering $880 million for the worst drug dealers in the world, um, while we're selling, sending people to jail for smoking joints uh, and, and whatever else, um, but we can't even send the individuals at HSBC who committed those crimes we can't even indict them, because that also might affect, affect the economy. Last week, uh, just to end on this, last week I actually interviewed um, the executives from the only bank that has been indicted since the financial crisis, and it's a small, community-owned uh, <laughs> Chinese bank called Abacus Federal Savings which had a loan officer way back in, 19, in 2009 um, accept a bribe to doctor a mortgage application. And he did this, uh, unfortunately, in front of um, the daughter of the owner of the, of the bank, uh, who immediately reported it to the OCC and to Fannie Mae. Uh, and for self-reporting, for doing the right thing, this company became the only company to face indictment uh, in the entire history of the financial crisis. And the reason that this is important to point out is that collateral consequences, this whole concept of we can't indict big companies, too big to jail, too big to fail, it sounds like it makes sense in some context. Certainly you don't want to have Arthur Anderson go completely out of business, for instance, that maybe that's, maybe that's reasonable. But what they, f what they didn't realize is that when they defined what kind of a company is too big to prosecute and what kind of executive is too important to prosecute, they were also simultaneously creating the definition for people who were just unimportant enough to prosecute and companies that were just small enough to prosecute. And that's what Abacus Federal Savings Bank was. It, it defined who was small enough to prosecute. So now we have this sort of systematic, institutionalized um, machine of unfairness where we are prosecuting the little guy and we are letting the big guys go. And that's why we need ideas like yours, because, uh, like the Public Banking Institute, because um, left unchecked, I think this, this, this is sort of what I want to uh, highlight, is that it's really getting to be high time. I mean, it's gonna be too late to do anything uh, if we don't act soon, because it's getting to the point where they're gonna be too hard to reach. They've, you know, they've already, reach the point where they're committing crimes that are outrageous and going completely untouched uh, right out in the open. Uh, so if we don't do something soon, if the public isn't educated quickly uh, and they don't realize how bad the situation has gotten, then we're really not gonna have a chance to really do anything about it, I think, uh, again, in the near future. So we need you know, this idea, we need people like you, and we need, I think we need the Public Banking Institute. I think it's, it provides an alternative to this system which has proven itself to be completely corrupt uh, and autocratic and anti-democratic. Um, and, and so we needed to keep going. Um, anyway, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh,
Ellen. Great. Thanks, Matt. That was great. So he did just what I was hoping he would do. <laughs> Outline the fact that what we have now is totally corrupt, exploitative, unsustainable, and it has to be changed. We have to do something else. Um, it, there's another thing that, that we haven't been told that's been suppressed for uh, a couple hundred years at least, and that is that there's another alternative, that there's a whole history of publicly owned banks that, it, that is sustainable, that it's a system that is sustainable, going all the way back to Samaria and Egypt. The original banking system actually was not individual traders bartering gold. It actually was a public banking system that came down from on top. It was the Sumerian temple, and in Egypt it, was, it came down from the pharaoh, and you had the your granaries that were actually, in effect, grain banks because money then was grain or it was actual things. So, so we've actually degenerated into a system in which banking is privately owned, but that system has parasitically eaten up the other system and suppressed the other system, so we, we haven't really heard about it. So that's what I've written about, in first in Web of Debt, and then now I have a... a uh, just finished a book called The Public Bank Solution. In Web of Debt, it sort of culminated in our one, our one public banking model. We've only got one in the whole country, and that's uh, the Bank of North Dakota. I mean, we have lots of infrastructure banks, which are, which are sort of revolving, revolving loan funds, but the Bank of North Dakota actually operates like a depository bank. I mean, it is a depository bank. So all of the state's revenues go into the bank, as deposits and then they can leverage that or they they also have capital and so they leverage their capital back by their deposits to create loans equal to their deposit base which if you took that model and you did it in California California has 200 billion over 200 billion in their pension funds they have over 200 billion in real estate we have 70 billion in the just in the in treasurer's investment pool, I mean, we have a huge asset base and a huge potential deposit base. So if we did what North Dakota does, which is one fifteenth the size of LA County, I'm from LA, so I mean, it's very small. If we did that, what they did, we could do amazing things here in this state. And in fact, California is the eighth largest economy in the world. At one time, it was the sixth largest economy. There is no reason why we do not have our own banking system. We are dependent on a system of basically of international bankers or international central banks controlled from Switzerland. Switzerland tells us what our capital requirement is. And in fact, you could argue the whole capital requirement is bogus. It was first imposed in 1988 to bring down the Japanese banks, which were, which were then the dominant creditors in the world. And Americans were afraid that the Japanese were going to, we were all afraid we were going to be taken over, that they'd be taking our jobs or buying up our companies. And so to allow our banks to be competitive, they imposed this capital requirement that, that the Japanese banks were not able to meet and that put Japan into a recession. And then Basel II, that was called Basel I, and then Basel II actually brought down our banks. Um, it was the mark-to-market rule. So um, the whole, we were, the way the American banks got around the capital requirement was to um, do what um, Matt was talking about, where, the, where they had this, where you would sell off your loans to investors. So it was all like collateralized debt obligations where you'd have this bundle of mortgages wrapped in a derivative that supposedly protected them and made them into these fungible units that you could trade. But what they did was get the loans off their books so that if you, if you only had the capital, like if you had a, let's say you had $100,000 in capital, you could make a um, a million dollars in loans at a 10% capital requirement, and then you have to sit there and wait for 30 years until those loans got paid back before you can make any more loans. So that was obviously killing the business. And so 
by selling the loans, getting the loans off their books, they could make more and more loans. But in 2004, the um, Basel II came down, which uh, imposed the, another regulation, which said that you had to value your capital according to the price it would fetch today. So it would be like if you had a stock and it all of a sudden dropped in value, you'd be forced to sell it at the bottom. You couldn't, even though this was not a realistic thing for banks, that they would actually hang on to these bundles of mortgages that they had until until there was a good market and they were they were actually still paying mortgage uh, paying assets so it so that brought down the, the US banks in 2007 which led to the 2008 collapse and now we have Basel 3 which is appears to be designed to bring down the small community banks so you have the large international banks which can actually meet the Basel 3 requirements but the little community banks, which are the banks that make the loans to the to the community, to the individual, to the small businesses, they can't meet their capital requirement, and so they're they've been forced to sell out to the big banks. So the big banks are just getting larger and larger. The idea was to regulate the big banks that brought on the credit crisis, and instead, what's happened is they've been allowed to gobble up the small banks, and now what we have is bail-in, which is the most threatening of all. It's the, the Cyprus thing where um, two, two large bankrupt banks in Cyprus were required to take their depositors' m funds and turn them into to equity. In other words, they were required to recapitalize themselves by actually confiscating their depositors' funds. And that looked like a like a one-off, you know, it's just a little island in Cyprus. But in fact, that same template is, all the G20 countries are supposed to be doing the same thing. It came down from the, 20, uh, from, uh, the Global Financial Stability Board in um, 2000, uh, 20, two, uh, sorry, 2011. They issued this template and everybody else was supposed to do it, where you would take your your depositors' money and turn it into equity or capital in the bank. So now we have a situation where it used to be the bank was there for the depositors. Well, now we're there for the bank, and these large international banks must be preserved at all costs. They're too big to fail under all conditions, even if it means taking the depositors' money, and that's actually being legitimized now with these, with these templates. So there is another alternative, and that is what, it used to, what used to be was that the FDIC would actually nationalize a bank that was too big to fail. That's what they were supposed to do, was nationalize the bank. And that's what they should do, and they've done it before, like Continental Illinois was the biggest um, bank bankruptcy in the, up to the 1990s, and they nationalized Continental Illinois. And, but then what they do is they give it back to the, to the private interest when they get it back on their feet. But what they really should do is take that bank, nationalize it, and make it our bank. It's our money. You could use those large... So, so that would happen at the federal level, but we don't have a lot of leverage over the federal level. So. So what we're really talking about at the, is state banks, uh, county banks, city banks, something that we have more leverage over, something that we as a, as a movement can go in and talk to our legislators um, and try to get them to set up, set up banks that now that we have this bail-in thing, it really is in the local government's interest to have their own bank. I mean, one of the arguments against that, we now have 20 states that have introduced bills of one sort or another for state-owned banks. Yeah, which is a lot. That's, that's since the 2008 crisis. So we've got, we've got momentum, we've got one leg up, but we need to get the other leg up, which me means we have to overcome these, this sort of inertia where politicians, you know, don't really want to change things unless they, they have a good reason. Like either they have a big push from the, from the people or they have just some compelling reason. Well, the bail-in thing is a compelling reason. I mean, that's a reason why that could, the next big default, the next big crisis 
could happen overnight. You don't know till you open up your computer and you see this great big drop like that, that it happened, or the 29 collapse or whatever. So the last one was $700 billion. There's 25 billion in the FDIC insurance fund. Uh, the Dodd-Frank legislation specifically says that we, the taxpayers, will not be responsible the next time there is a big derivatives bust. JP Morgan and Bank of America both have um, over $70 trillion in uh, notional value of derivatives, and they both have, have over $1 trillion in deposits. So if either of them had a big derivatives bust, the, the clincher is that the derivatives claims go first in, in bankruptcy. They have super priority in bankruptcy since the 2005 Bankruptcy Reform Act. And this was to help this fledgling industry of the derivatives. It was basically to help the big banks to get, get their market share back. So, so they got this special privilege of going first in bankruptcy. Well, so envision a large derivatives bust, even say half a trillion dollars. Um, they are going to take all the, all the collateral. So the state and local governments that think that they're protected, that think they have secured deposits are gonna get wiped out. And of course, we're gonna get wiped out and we will turn to the FDIC and say, you know, you're supposed to protect our deposits. And the FDIC will say, well, Dodd-Frank says that, that, or the Treasury will say, we're, we're not allowed to bail out the FDIC because, because there's now legislation saying that the taxpayers won't bail out bail out the um, bail out another big bank derivatives bus. What they should should have done was get rid of the super priority. They should have reinstated the part of Glass Steagall that allowed these banks to to merge their but but they haven't done it. So to protect ourselves, if only to protect ourselves our state and local governments should set up their own banks. It it, you could set up a bank overnight if you were motivated. If, if they had a reason, you could set up an internet bank. Um, you could buy out a bankrupt bank. You could, it would, for like $20 million, you could set up a decent bank, put all your revenues in it, and there you, your revenues would be protected to start. And then you could start getting creative with what you're gonna do with these revenues. 20 million. Mm -hmm. There, in the the Bank of North Dakota model, North Dakota is the only state that escaped the credit crisis. They um, they have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on loans, and the um, lowest foreclosure rate. So, and they they return the Bank of North Dakota returns 30 million dollars annually to the state to the state government. So it's a big revenue maker for this, for this state that is only 670,000 people. So again, think of the revenues you could generate with, with the Bank of California. One objection to the Bank of North Dakota as a, a model, you know, when you bring these up to pol politicians, they'll say, well, that's just one state, or they've got oil, and you know, for some reason they're different from our state. So that's actually, largely why I wrote this second book on the public bank solution, that to look around the world at other models and back in history at other models, well, there was this huge wealth of information that we just, it's amazing to see all this stuff that we just aren't told about. 40% um, of banks globally are publicly owned. These are largely in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which house 40% of the global population, and all of them beat the credit crisis, just like North Dakota did. And their secret of this remarkable growth that they've had, well, China has grown at the rate of, t up until recently, they had grown at the rate of 10% a year for 30 years, which is just unheard of. It's just year after year after year of growth. And how they did it is they own the the credit machine, so they can issue credit as needed where it's needed. They don't have to pay this parasitic banking structure that now takes, it, it, in its best years, it actually had the US uh, financial sector took 40% of corporate profits. And what do they make? Nothing. I mean, they are just creaming profits out of 
the, the profits of the producing companies. Um, so we have the, these great models around the world and historically showing that this would work. And we've been sort of brainwashed into believing that if government created its own money or if government borrowed from its own bank, that this would be inflationary. But it wouldn't be, and that, and that is what, what we wind up doing is borrowing from banks, which create the money on their books instead of our, our, cent, our own publicly owned bank creating, creating the money. Um, so I've written about all that, and I have all the data, and I'm afraid I forgot to watch my... Okay. End it there for now, okay. and uh, there'll be some questions and people a chance to ask you some questions. Thank okay. you very much, Alvin.